Thank you very much for taking the time to join me today. I just thought this was a good topic to kind of talk shop. And really, the whole inspiration of it um, happened when I did the last live stream where we were speculating about Canon specs um, on their cameras and what we like about their cameras, what we don't like about their cameras, and so on. And I thought, well, one of my favorite cameras, and you guys have heard me say this a lot, is the red komodo and it has been for multiple years at this point because it is a very good camera that is really versatile in so many ways and i'm a firm believer that red has been pushing the envelope you know in ways like to the bleeding edge um, with their camera systems for as long as red's been in existence and they then made the Komodo and they made the Komodo at an incredibly affordable price point um, where I and several of my friends felt that it was grossly underpriced for what it's able to produce. And going back to the whole inspiration for today's um, episode is that the last time that I did a YouTube Live, I really had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun interacting with people reading the questions, you know, just doing the whole comment thing. And that is one of the things that I really have enjoyed about YouTube and the YouTube community over the years. So let's just do it on my favorite camera today. Now, 
I'm not exaggerating when I say that by all standards, right, given the DSM-C3 line, the Red Komodo is kind of like the grandpa. Red Komodo came out way before the designation DSM-C3 was awarded to any other camera. And it had been around, and it was, in, in some cases, still is not readily available. Like, you can't just walk into the store and pick one up and leave. Um, maybe there are some cases where that does happen these days, but for the most part, it isn't. The Komodo also brought in a lot of people from other brands, whether it be Panasonic, Blackmagic, Canon, Sony, and so on, and got people to want to buy the Komodo, want to shoot on the Komodo. Many of them stayed with the Komodo. Others went away from the Komodo because they realized that the type of workflow that they do or, or the type of work that they are paid to do maybe doesn't need a Komodo type quality. But I'm here to tell you, the red Komodo has an X factor that is incredible. Now, here's what, I'm, what I mean by this. And I, I have a lot of friends where we talk shop like this on a fairly regular basis. Well, I have friends who owned DSMC2 back when I did too, had, you know, the 8K Helium or had the Gemini or a Gemini and a Helium or a Monstro and a Gemini or any combination thereof, right? And when I started shooting on Komodo, I kept saying to people, to all my friends, all my buddies, you all need to see what this camera is able to do. And I would get little pushbacks and fightbacks about, oh, it's Super 35. I don't want to go back to shooting Super 35 anymore. Or you need a Canon adapter. Or that RF mount is really loose and wiggly. Um, it's not going to give me the type of, you know, shooting experience that I want. I want this. Like, there were excuses. Like, more excuses than you might think is normal. Because I, I, I was like, how can you have an excuse about something? How can you say something negative about a product when you've never used it? If you've never used it, then how do you know? How do you know that the image quality is not going to be on par with what you expect? How do you know that the noise, as you might think, in a Super 35 sensor is going to be so much worse than what you get out of 8K on a DSMC2 body. How do you know? You don't know. And you don't know until you begin to use that tool. And I'll tell you, 10 out of 10 people that I know in the circles that I hang around with, with, you know, the nerdy guys like me, the people that, you know, do 50% photography, 50% video, the people that are shooting weddings on multiple red cameras, you know, so really high-end stuff, commercial shooters, YouTubers, and so on. Every single tier and person, type of person, that had the opportunity to either use one of my cameras or they rented a camera or their buddy brought a camera for them to use or whatever, every single one of them at this point loved the Komodo image. Every single one. I never heard anyone complain about the noise or, or how it rendered the noise. I never heard anyone complain about it's Super 35. The mount and the, the mount being able to hold really heavy lenses, that is an issue. There are fixes for it. They're not fixes that come when you buy the Komodo, you know, for $6,000. You got to buy extra stuff. But you can you can adapt other lenses to it, even heavy lenses to it, and have it be very stable. It was the first camera that had that level of quality and the red level of post-production support of its kind and at a price point that was just incredible. 
Because you look at that $6,000 price point, and we begin to talk about some mirrorless cameras that are, you know, flagship cameras for some brands. We begin to talk about some, you know, Canon C70-ish type cameras. C70 is a beast. It's a great camera, but it's not a Komodo. And then when you begin to compare what a Komodo image is able to do and give you, you're looking way beyond that $6,000 price point. You don't care that it's a 6K image when you're comparing it against 8K image and the Komodo looks better. Or the Komodo does a better job at retaining information in the highlights. Or the Komodo makes it easier for you to work in whatever type of environment that you're in. Or the fact that you can control it with an app that runs on your phone and it feels like it has zero delay. Or the fact that it can have its own infrastructure and, and on and on and on, right? There's a lot of tech packed into this little body, which now is going to lead me into saying hello to some of the people that are here in the comments. So let's, um, Steelworks, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> you thought I'm, I was going to make a new camera announcement? Red doesn't talk to me that way. I don't, I don't have those kind of connections. I think Red knows I exist. Um, and they probably think I just do YouTube videos or social media stuff. But I don't think Red would ever allow me to be the person that breaks the news on a new camera. So that's kind of funny. So good afternoon, Steelworks. Um, thank you very much for the super sticker. Really appreciate it. <laughs> that's a funny statement there. Um, great camera. But cable management is not easy. Shame that Red did not give us a way to connect. Um, oh, the top connection specs that would have given us the option for great accessories with less cables. So, Anthony, or can I call you Tony? Um, here's what I'm going to say. So when DSMC2 came out, and essentially we had the ability to rig up a camera with zero cables, I was like in heaven. And then once I started, or I had to shoot with other cameras that still required me to do cable management, think about how I'm going to route things, start mounting a bunch of extra accessories to it, I realized that all cameras that are going to be rigged are going to require some sort of cable management system. To the point where I belly ached enough about it that I sold my first Canon C70 because I couldn't handle, I couldn't wrap my head around needing to use an adapter to connect my XLR into the camera because I use the AVX system quite a bit and that is able to go right into a full-size XLR so that I don't need to have a cable. With the C70, I need either something like this, this adapter, or I need a <laughs> mini XLR to regular XLR cable that then I need to deal with the whole dongle thing. And with the C70, the other thing that you need is you need an actual external monitor because the little screen is a little bit too small to to help you frame up. It's, it's kind of fine, but it's not good enough and it doesn't have an EVF. So all of a sudden I started kind of getting over this idea of needing to have zero cable management on any of my any of my um, cameras. I'll also say that that's a first world problem because back when I got started, 5D Mark II days, rigging anything on it meant I had to do cable management. Even with bigger cameras like the C300 Mark II, Mark III, the C500 Mark I, Mark II, the actual monitor screen requires an actual cable that then plugs into the body. So there's never been a true no wires needed system other than DSMC2. And then one day, this actually happened to me, where one day I needed to be able to use a monitor that was daylight viewable. 
because in the actual shoot, I was taking off my coat, putting it over my head so I can see the the monitor that I had for my DSMC2. So I needed uh, a daylight viewable monitor. This is before Red made one. So I bought a small HD um, Cine 7, daylight viewable, beautiful colors, works great. And guess what? I now need to run an SDI cable into my body. <laughs> so all of a sudden, my no need for cable management became a thing once again, which actually was always a thing because I, I ran wireless on it. So I had to do some sort of cable management with that anyway. And then I thought, well, I really, really love the fact that I could do a touch control to navigate the menus on my DSMC2 monitor, which really meant I need to buy red control. That's a, I think it's like $500 piece of software accessory that you, or license that you buy to enable it on the small HD monitors. That was now another cable. And if I didn't want to use batteries, <laughs> which again, on my red monitor, I don't have to use batteries because it's using the juice right from the camera. I then needed to have a power option into that monitor. So the whole cable management thing for me, or lack of cable management thing, lasted approximately two years. And after that, I, I had to go back to wrangling wires. So yeah, I mean, it, it would be awesome if there was such a thing as never needing to do cable management on a camera. At this point, I choose the quality over my inconvenience for whatever that's worth. Are they finally going to include gyro data like they should have at launch, say, GoPro replacement and no gyro data for stabilization, which sucks. So I believe that that was part or is part of the firmware that they're working on. So I think that, yeah, they will include it because I think they will. Uh, let's see. I just want an EVF for Komodo. So Driven Films is, is spot on. Here's, here's the thing, right? So like I thought about just biting the bullet and buying the Zakudo EVF, which I used to own and I don't now. But I really want an EVF from Red. I don't want an EVF from somebody else for my Red camera. And the reason for it is that, okay, so I don't want to put anybody on blast, okay? But imagine that your standards are loose. So here, I'll do this. There are some people that make wireless transmitters, right? That claim this is a 4K wireless transmitter. Well, it can accept the 4K signal, but it can't transmit a 4K signal. So then, is it a 4K wireless transmitter? And something similar to that happens with EVFs. Just because you can take in, you know, a higher resolution image doesn't mean that what you're seeing is actually going to be higher resolution. And that's one of the things that I remember, you know, back in the day when I had a lot of friends that were shooting on C200s and I was shooting on, on my um, red 8K Helium. I remember going on set, working with them, and then I would punch in one-to-one -one, and they would see a one-to-one -one comparison on my monitor so that I could judge my critical focus, right? Because we don't have autofocus. C200 has autofocus and so on. And they were like, wait, why does that look so good? Because RED made this monitor for their cameras. That's the same reason why I enjoyed the RED EVF more than I enjoyed the Zakudo EVF, you know, because I tried taking the I'm going to save some cash route and went the Zakudo route. But then if I wanted false color, I need to pay for that license. If I wanted to have zebras, I need to pay for that license. And before you know it, it costs as much as a red EVF. So I just got rid of it and I bought the red one. So that's how that worked out. But with an EVF, then I can actually go 
potentially smaller on my external monitor without losing any quality. Quality for me in the way that I judge my exposure, my scene, and so on. So yeah, I, I would think that would be really, really great. And, you know, maybe even allow me to go without an external monitor and just use my phone if I need to see something bigger or show someone what the camera's actually seeing. So I totally agree. Still love my Komodo. Yeah, Komodo, dude. Um, you would imagine or you would think I'm collecting Komodos at this point because they are the workhorse for the organization. So I still love mine too. Excited for Red's uh, BS Pan to get thrown out next year. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what to say about that. Here's my feeling or my take. I don't care. If everyone was doing the exact same thing that Red is doing or trying to, which by the way they are, right? If we're totally honest with each other. If everyone was trying to fit all the features of a red Komodo into all of their bodies and then give you the extras, whatever the extras are. Could they do it for $6,000? And the answer is probably not. I mean, you look at some of the mirrorless systems, they exceed that. You look at the C70, that would be the closest. And it... You know, like if I had if I had to make a decision, like a life or death decision about which camera I needed and I could only pick one to shoot with for the rest of 2023, it would be the Red Komodo. There isn't another camera that I am familiar enough with to be able to step into any situation and know that I'm going to walk out with exactly what I need to make my project successful. And I'm not saying there aren't any other capable cameras, just so that we're clear here. There are plenty of capable cameras. But I've taken the time, the effort to understand my Komodos to make sure that I am successful. And can I say that about the C70? I feel pretty confident with the C70. I feel pretty confident with the C500 Mark II. I even feel confident with the R5C. But I know that in some of the scenarios that I've been in, whether they are just lit with practical lights or I'm using studio lights in a single one-man show run and gun environment or multicam environment, Komodo has never disappointed. So that's why my expectation is so much higher. So yeah, I don't, I guess all that to say that I don't care about a patent. I don't care about anything else because these are tools that I learned how to use and I enjoy using and I'm comfortable supporting RED. Um, I recently picked up a Fujifilm X-H2S and that camera has some pretty impressive dynamic range, particularly in the 14-bit F-Log2 mode. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that camera at all because the only Fujifilm camera that I own is the GFX100S and um, I don't shoot video with it. It's strictly a stills camera for me and I, I enjoy it. But also, I enjoy the image processing and the way that Fuji interprets color, which is one of the reasons why I really like it. People crying about the lens mount being insecure have never heard of lens support. <laughs> so that is true. That's true because lens supports have always been around. And um, yeah, PL glass, some of it is pretty heavy. Not a Komodo replacement, but for lightweight travel, it's awesome. Yeah, so that's the other thing, right? So like I've found myself in scenarios where I've had to go you know, do random things with family or whatever. And I thought, should I bring a Komodo? And I end up picking a mirrorless camera instead. Because a Komodo really isn't a, let me put it in my pocket, pull it out and 
be opportunistic with this moment type camera. That's not what that is. But for any paid work, I'll always pick Komodo over something else. Exposing the Komodo is mindless, easy, once you understand how to use traffic lights. Absolutely true. And that's actually true for any of the red cameras. So once you understand the goalposts, once you understand the traffic lights, like you have to purposely try to screw up your shot because you're neglecting everything you know about exposure. Um, let's see here. What's good, Amsterdam in the house? Thanks, Thomas and Lisa. Thanks for stopping by. I don't think Red would mind if you were just a YouTuber. That's Red's main market. They have near zero representation in the big leagues. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Have you guys heard of this guy named Phil Holland? You might have. So you should check out his IMDb. I mean... Or go on Red's website and then see all the features that have been shot on Red cameras. I feel like Red has enough representation. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy is one of my favorite all-time franchises. And they've been shot on Red cameras. So, I don't know. I think some people are always going to hate on Red. Just like some people always hate on Sony. Some people always hate on Canon. Personally, I don't care. I pick Red and I use Canon as my fallback system. <laughs> okay. The Komodo is top choice for virtual production as the global shutter does not show LED wall artifacts. I hadn't thought about that. And we just actually set up our virtual production um, stage. So I'll, th that's actually a really good content idea um, to try to cover. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, production's major point. I didn't consider that. Oh. Okay. Y'all are having your own conversation. More of your own conversation. Honestly, if Red didn't update the Komodo any further, or even if they don't release another mode, I'm totally fine with for what it is today. So I feel exactly like Driven Films. But that's not what this live stream is about. So let's talk about what I would be willing on compromising with, maybe. And maybe you guys can share in your comments what you guys think, or what you guys would like to see, if there was ever an upgrade to uh, Komodo. I'll start by saying that if Red moved away from the RF mount and went back to the EF mount on Komodo, but gave us the internal ND system that we see on Raptor XL and on, I think it's, it's um, Rhino XL also has it. If they did that, I would trade all of my Komodos for, for those Komodos, for the new version. I don't care if it's an EF mount. If I have built-in NDs and I don't have to think about ND at all because I know it's part of my camera body, then I'm going to run with it. I love that idea. What else would I change? I personally, because I have a lot of this type of media, would like to see them go from CF CF 2.0 to CF Express Type B, similar to what we have on Raptor. If they change that media, then that means my offloading media transfer times speed up. And like I said, I have a lot of that media because of the R5Cs. So that would be kind of cool. I don't I don't know that I would be as interested if they had dual slots for media. I don't know that that's ever been a real benefit to me. And I'll tell you why. Because I use 
the um, Blackmagic Video Assist 7-inch screen. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to output from Komodo a 4K image via 12G SDI into my monitor that then allows me to record whether I want with the LUT, you know, the red LUT baked in or in R3D log, right? So just the log version onto this external monitor as a backup. And I use the new um, SanDisk, I don't know what they are, they're four terabytes. So I'm able to have a redundant copy of whatever it is that I'm shooting in 4K, not 6K, in 4K. And that actually works for me. And it works well. I've never had to use my backups. But as a redundancy point, it gives me enough confidence to know that I can fall back on a 4K ProRes 422HQ file if I had to. So I think those would be the only things that I would I would want. Like I had a conversation earlier today with one of my buddies and we were talking about, hey, wouldn't you like to see, you know, audio on board through some sort of module or something for a red camera? And the truth is, I don't care. Like I'm used to doing dual audio. I like working with time code. It makes it easy. I don't have to think about, you know, is it one channel, two channels or 15 channels? I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. So I don't care if, if red never changes the way that they do audio. And D that gets my interest up there, like way up there. So I think that's it. Um, I don't know that I would change anything else. I mean, if the body had to get a little bit bigger to accommodate some of the internal mechanism that's going to make an ND work or not work, I wouldn't care if it was a little bit bigger. Because once I build out my Komodos, they, they are a little bit bigger. They're chunkier. They're, they're bigger, right? So I wouldn't care. Um, if Red made or partnered with someone that made a specific monitor that had Red Control built in for it, I think that would be kind of cool. But if they don't, small HD works. And if I want red control, um, I can do that. I will say one thing that I now know I cannot live without is that brand new multicam red control app that runs on your iPad or iPad Pro. That is awesome. So I was in a, I was shooting a project and I was doing multicam and for whatever reason, the I needed to use my phone as my backbone infrastructure for the cameras in my iPad so that I could actually control all the cameras because we were shooting with a skeleton crew, right? Like three or less people. No, three people, four people. One person was doing nothing but just standing there. That's not fair. That was their job. <laughs> that was their job. So I had to I had to use my phone to, you know, basically bond them all and, and be able to manage my my uh my cameras and it worked flawlessly. Like I can't live without that anymore. So I don't even know if that can even get any better than what it is already, but definitely continue to do whatever it takes to allow that ecosystem to continue beyond the lifespan of Komodo. I think that that would be really, really cool. Okay, so I'm going to, let's see if I could go back to comments here. So we saw the comment from Driven Films that just put me into that last, um, the, the last little bit here. And then, let's see, uh, originally advertised it was a crash cam, action cam. You know, I'm just going to say, I don't want to see my Komodo destroyed <laughs> because Komodo makes us money, makes us a good living um, here where we're at. I replaced the Porky's OI fan and now the EVF really does it for me. Really? On the Komodo. So I, I had the OI 
the port keys OI. And my problem is that if I didn't look straight down the middle, I would get all kinds of warping artifacts. It's like the plastic eyepiece lens, it's just, it's not good enough quality. So I couldn't recommend that to anyone. So Driven Films, I thought they were working in gyro data too. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I've heard that more than once. So I think that they are in fact working on it. Um, I use the Secuto Chameleon as an EVF and it works great. So, Anthony, is that Chameleon, is that a, a 1080 or 720 EVF? Do you know what, what the actual picture is um, that you would see? Is that 720 or 1080? Uh, let's see here. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, Faith House. Good point. I would like to see Komodo go all the way up to 60p, at least. So in 6K, 60p, without cropping into the sensor, that would be a really kick-ass advantage. If they could do, you know, more frame rates at 5K and more frame rates at 4K, that would be cool. But for what I do, 60p would be a sweet spot because then I would never have to rely on another camera. I could literally just only work with Komodo. So that would be, that's a good point. Um, I don't need slow motion a lot, but occasionally... That 60p comes in handy. Uh, but the frame rates kind of compromise that, no. So the, the frame rates are probably the only thing. So like I, I was on a project where I could have used a little bit of slow motion. I just shot it in 48 frames per second. And then I, you know, pretended it was kind of slow motion um it did the job could i have used 60 yes would 120 have worked better if i was shooting in 8k um probably i didn't have that, those tools on me at the moment so it didn't matter we just make it work also those shots that i'm talking about that i shot at 48 they never even made it on the shot list there were shots that were created on the spot the day of after we were there to shoot so you know in those scenarios i don't feel bad about it uh let's see red deserves that patent so i i agree <laughs> i agree um cool thank you You know, I haven't met anyone who wants a Komodo that didn't like it. Same here. And mostly YouTubers, not going to name anyone that picked one up, tried it, couldn't figure out IPP2 workflow and gave up on it. I've seen that happen. Um, I've also seen where someone, who I'll call them a YouTuber, maybe they don't want to be called that, but that's how they make their living. Thought it was too expensive. <laughs> like, um, I don't, I don't know. But you know, when I'm not going there, doesn't matter. Um, let's see. You get one filmmaker one year on red makes up a tiny fraction of the camera shooting. <sighs> so, I think that this is kind of where I'm at with your statement when it comes to who is doing what with what, right? Do I think that Ari makes great cameras? Yes. Do I think Blackmagic makes good cameras for their market? Yes. Do I think Canon makes good cameras? Yes. Do I care what anyone is shooting on that does not affect my livelihood, my crew's livelihood, or my business? And the answer is, not really. 
If they're my friends, yes, because now I know I can help them if they use similar tools to me. If they're not my friends and they needed my help, they probably would just find someone within their own circle to help them rather than come and ask me. So I've never shot a feature film, but I've shot commercials that air nationally in the United States. And I've shot commercials for other countries across the globe. Italy, Japan, Spain, Chile, Canada. And I got to meet a lot of different people that do some very specific work that is not the type of work that I do. So I'm not going to ever judge a camera brand or company by the total number of users that are using it to do a very specific type of work. You know, like Sony cameras, for example, their FX9, FX6. In the broadcast world, in the ENG world, they kick ass. In the solo content creator world, I think the FX6 is probably better than the FX9, and it would kick ass. But for someone like me, I'd rather use a different tool. I don't like the whole idea of this very light, plasticky camera. I don't, I need to know that whatever situation I, I put my camera through, that it's going to come out on the other end in one piece. And that's not something I can say about a camera that is mostly built out of plastic or plastic composite parts. So I'll just leave it at that. Now, can I afford an airy camera? Even if I could, I wouldn't buy one because I don't need one because my clients aren't asking for that. My clients really aren't asking for red either, but I'm giving them red and it takes very little effort to keep all of my clients happy. So then there's that. Uh, let's see here. I think that Komodo will not have a successor for a while because it's good enough for what it's made for. What could make Komodo better? Well, I mean, Komodo could be better for me if it had built-in NDs. So I don't care if that means switching out the mount and making it PL and or EF only. That would work. Um, if it could do 60p, that would make it better. And if I could get faster media in Komodo, you know, like CF Express Type B, that would make it better for me. Are any of those deal breakers? No. <laughs> right? So pie in the sky, me just, you know, talking shop here with all of you. That's what would make it better. Uh, let's see. And, yeah, frame rates. So 60p would be nice. Um, anything above 60p, you know, at 5K and even 4K, I, I could live with. But 60p is really probably where I would max out with the type of work that I do. Okay, if there's an upgrade. <laughs> If there's an upgrade, everything like in tech, everything has to continue to evolve, right? Like we saw Red drop Raptor, then we saw them drop Rhino, then we saw drop the um, Excel bodies. Everything has to continue to move um, because tech is moving. So I'm guessing there will be at some point an update. No idea when. Uh, let's see here. If you cannot get good results from Komodo, well, it's not the camera's fault. <laughs> uh, so uh, I 100% agree with what Angry Rabbit Productions just said. It's true. If you cannot get a good image out of Komodo, it is likely because you're using cheap glass or you don't understand exposure and composition. So there's room for everyone to grow. I'm not suggesting getting an Alexa or a single operator for owner operator. Yeah, that'll never happen. Even like a company my size, which is, you know, I think you guys know, right? We have like 70 people on staff. 
um, we run three crews, and Alexa is not in our future. And I know Maddie <laughs> has or is working now with an Alexa for some of the work that he's doing. I'm guessing he's not only making YouTube channels or YouTube videos anymore. So, but maybe, probably not though. Um, for ND, I use Skipper Tie uh, Revolva EF to RF, and is brilliant. It feels like integrated ND filters, and and really that is probably the best ND filter solution on the market um, for Komodo. There was another company that was making like these drop-in ND filters. I forget the name of that company, but like you would buy the set and you have no idea when you're going to get them. And of course, we went through the whole COVID thing whatever so i never went that route i went with b plus w this is the next best thing to the kipper tie solution in my opinion uh let's see here swappable mounts that could be cool mini xlr i don't care about audio but that's that's a good point second independent um, sdi port Multiple monitoring ports, that's true. That would be good. 4K 60p, I'm not done reading. Come on, leave it up here. Um, 6K 60p and 4K 120, yeah. CF Express cards type B. Yep, same as me. A freaking EVF and a monitor that doesn't require cables. Um, okay, so here's what I'll say about the monitor that doesn't require cables. I wish I had a picture, and I don't right now. But, so imagine that we're going for an eyeline shot, and the talent is as tall as I am. So the camera needs to be, the lens, right, needs to be here. With well, the monitors up here, how are you going to see it? And the only way to get a monitor that requires no cables is if it's attached directly to the body which really means you now need to bring something for you to stand up on to, to actually be able to see that monitor. Unless there was a way to mount the monitor on the side where you can then tilt it down and you can actually look at your composition that way. So that would be kind of like DSMC2, right? Where you can mount it on the side or you can mount it on top. Short of that, a monitor that doesn't require cables it's almost like one of those luxury blingy things that you buy for your camera that is going to become less useful if you shoot on sticks or you shoot in scenarios that don't allow you to have the camera here. So I'm not sure that I'm like totally in love with the idea. I would probably buy it, which is bad, right? But I wouldn't get as much use out of it because I use my bright tangerine um, arm to mount my monitor so I can position it anywhere I want. The camera's up here. I have the monitor right in front of my face. The camera's down here. I have the monitor right in front of my face. So I, that's, that's just the way that I work. But I can see the benefits if, say, you're a gimbal operator or you're operating on the gimbal and you know that this is basically where your monitor will always be, that would come in handy and it would make life a lot easier. So maybe an option for it would be cool. Um, built in, I'm guessing you're going to say EVF, not EVD would be, I don't know that they would ever do a built in EVF though. What do you guys think? Built in EVF? I feel like a built in EVF is, it's kind of the same restriction where the only way to use it is if you're always in that same fixed position. And I'm not, I don't know. I, I don't know that I, I would want an EVF that I couldn't position to where I needed based on how I was shooting. Uh, let's see. Proxy recording like B-Raptor and Zcam models have. So... I kind of touched on that um, earlier where my proxy is really being recorded by an external monitor in 4K, um, Apple ProRes 422HQ. And I'm cool with that. Um, it wouldn't, I guess it'd be fine. 
But if if that meant burning through my media faster or burning through my batteries faster because it was doing, you know, redundant recording in the body, I would rather have the battery life and allow my monitor to do my redundant recording or my proxy recording. I think that I would be happy with that better instead. I think Komodo wouldn't be replacing time soon because it's a niche application camera. In its primary design philosophy, it's a global shutter crash cam for higher end productions. So, Tomas, I'll say this. I think that that was the intent of Komodo. I think that the intent when the camera was created, released out into the wild was to do exactly that job. But I think that what actually happened is that Komodo became a lot of people, mine included, our A camp. And this is kind of why I'm doing this video today. Uh, let's see. Eduardo Gonzalez. Good to see you, man. Do you prefer small HD Cine 7 with 1800 nits or the 2200 nits from Port Keys? Looking for a monitor that could potentially control the Komodo, but give me an awesome image. So the reason why I prefer the small HD monitor is because it has 100% p3 color coverage so i'd rather go that route than go with something that doesn't have the full color spectrum available for me to actually monitor i'll say this too on some of the more budget friendly monitors when you crank up the brightness you also begin to wash out the image so like automos is famous for that right oh yeah we have you know five million nits on xyz monitor you crank up the brightness and all of your contrast is completely gone. What good is that? So maybe test before you dive head first. Uh, let's see. Angry Rabbit likes port keys. And there, I, I just told you I didn't like mine, but whatever. Um, Kipper Tower Revolva is awesome. Totally. Downside found the green coating pollutes flares. In the clear filter. Hmm. I actually never heard of that before. Interesting. Um, I absolutely love the small HD control, but ever since the firmware update, I can't access the camera menu from the Indy 7. So, yes, that happened on one of our monitors. And then we stopped using the red control or whatever that red control thing is on the small HD monitors. And I dropped the ball. Thank you for reminding me because I was supposed to call small HD to figure out why that happened. So yes, it did happen to one of our monitors. I think we still have two that still works, but only because they didn't upgrade the firmware. But um, yeah, I'll follow up and I'll I'll reach out to you on IG when, uh, when I know what happened, if I know what happened. What do you think about the new DZO film Pavo anamorphic lenses? Um, I have, I haven't seen them. So I guess I'm waiting to see what Phil Hollins has to say about those lenses and then see what some of his tests do um, because somehow he manages to get his hands on just about every lens that is ever produced. <laughs> So, Levi Whitney is Uphill Cinema. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Um, gyro that is metadata now but needs to be implemented by the NLE. Thank you for that clarification. And thank you for the confirmation. Sweet. Thanks again. Uh, so, let's see. DZO film Pavo Anamorphic seems to be the pink cushion distortion and green coatings. On the bright side, they have large coverage for 2x scopes and a great form factor. Now you're making me want to go check out these lenses. So, interesting. And, yep, y'all are talking. This is good. Let's see here. Would love 4.3 sensor for anamorphic. Oh, 
Oh, I'm trying to remember a conversation I had about this. It'll come back to me, and when it does, I'll 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 remind you, or I'll tell you where to go see um, what that result was. But it's on Phil's channel for sure, or at least on his social media. Okay, so Levi just quoting me from earlier where I said we just make it work. And, and that's the fact, right? Like how many times do you think you have everything lined up exactly the way that it should go and you have to make zero adjustments? It's like filmmaking, it's not understanding the camera. It's not understanding the framing. It's not understanding the set design. It's a combination of all those things and then troubleshooting any one or multiple of those things in real time to make your day. That's what filmmaking is. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy it. Because it's just a matter of do whatever it takes to get the shot in a way that continues to move the story forward. Uh How about a face-only autofocus mode that doesn't rack when it loses the face? That, in my opinion, is one of the only flaws with the current Komodo for talking head VCAM work. So, I know that on the current Komodo, it's the actual app on your phone or on your tablet that is running the where the focus needs to be. So, if they were to upgrade Komodo hardware and they could build some sort of logic similar to what's in the iPhone to allow it to process a face, I think that would be kind of cool because that is one of the good things, one of the cool things about Canon cameras where you can do face only and like you lose the face, everything doesn't go back in focus, right? As long as you're using face priority. Um, and that I think Canon was the first one to come up with that. So I think there may be one or two Sony cameras that can kind of do that now. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that that would be a pretty good and interesting update. Hey, Scott. Good to see you, man. Uh, let's see. Pavel lenses are pink cushion at NAB. I didn't go to NAB. <laughs> Barrel distortion, okay. Uh, let's see. More comments. Here we go. Komodo can shoot uh, 6K 50 frames per second in 241 ratio. I live in Europe and it and I work in Pell, so it's perfect for me. Unfortunately, there is no 60 frames per second. Yeah, so Igor, like pie in the sky, if I could pick any one thing. I think that that would be my lowest priority. It is something that I use, but I don't use with enough frequency for it to make a, a gigantic difference. But um, but it would be awesome if somehow that did get updated or upgraded. Uh, let's see. Rest are for people who see a way to be creative in every step of the filmmaking process. If you aren't that way, I would imagine reds don't make sense for, to you. Well, Scott, I, I'm going to take that as a compliment because I love shooting on red. I, I think I've said this maybe more than most people who watch my channel would ever want to hear it. But they're really, and I loved my 8K Helium, okay? So I loved shooting in 8K, especially after I learned and got my infrastructure set up to be able to accommodate that workflow. I loved it. But Komodo, Komodo speeded up my post-production workflow and my cash flow coming into the business by more than 200%. So I'm in love with Komodo. Uh, let's see. 
I like to shoot all my TikToks on Alexa 65 <laughs> and on DNA Primes because YouTubers told me so. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, Levi. Um, I think that the YouTubers are finally just all saying Sony is the greatest and the only thing that you ever need to use. So we don't have to worry about weird comments like that. Maddie's the only one that actually went the Alexa route. But like I said, I don't think he's only doing YouTube videos. And maybe he's not doing any YouTube videos on the Alexa. Who knows? Uh, let's see. I go back to my previous statement. Doesn't matter what we shoot on as shoot on in the end as long as we get our jobs done. Absolutely, 100%. Agreed. I prefer to shoot vertical to <laughs> 239.1. Is that a joke or is that real? Like, do you really do vertical video? I mean, the, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. The reason why I bought the C70, that C70 right there, is because of vertical video. I'm not shooting vertical video on a red. I mean, I guess if somebody pays me enough, I'll, I'll shoot it on whatever they want me to shoot it. But um, but if I'm controlling the budget, the reds are not going to go vertical video for me today. Uh, let's see. It just made my Alexa go off. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Breakthrough. That was the name I couldn't think of. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, so... I mean, those look really promising whenever it is that they are readily available for us to buy because I still am, I mean, last I heard, which was probably three or four months ago, there was still no true ETA from when you pay for the item and when you get it. And Driven Films also, God, I'm way behind on these comments. Uh, let's see. Well, remember the DSMC2 monitor had the option to use a monitor or not. That's right, because they had a little dongle. That's true. And then the new version, the one that was daylight viewable, didn't even connect directly into the camera. It was like you needed to have an arm of some sort. And yes, a fixed monitor would be a luxury item and for me too. It's funny the things everybody complained about DSMC 1 and 2 were fixed with DSMC 3, and then everybody complained that those <laughs> features are now missing. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm in that boat of complaining that anything's missing. I really, like, honestly, I wouldn't change anything on the Komodo at this point because I just told you we've been able to more than double our profits because we're shooting on Komodo. But if I, if I could somehow say I'd like a Komodo custom built for me, having CF Express Type B media in the camera would be awesome. Having an EF mount that had the brand new red um, ND solution in the body would be awesome and 60 frames per second um, at 6K, that would be awesome too. Beyond those three things, I don't think there's anything that needs to happen for the camera to be customized to me for the type of shooting that I do. Uh, let's see here. To be fair, I don't really start shooting with red until Komodo. Oh, then there's that. I'm going to let you guys have that conversation. So the mags were expensive. I'll say that. But I also never had a mag fail on me. So then there's that too. Hey man, thanks for stopping by. Let's see here. Komodo just doesn't have the horsepower to record both proxies and regular. 
Um, I don't know if you missed it, Scott, but I basically said that I shoot my proxies or I record proxies by feeding out 4K from the um, 12G SDI into a Blackmagic Video Assist, the 7-inch. And then I just record in Apple ProRes um, 42HQ, and that's my proxy. Never had to use it, but because I can record onto a 4 terabyte SSD, if I ever needed it, I got a backup. Never have needed it, just to be clear. Um, yeah, this was a wish list for a new Komodo, Scott. Yep, wish list, exactly. So this is all pipe green, all speculate, speculative talk. For all I know, Komodo will never be upgraded, like to a Mark II or three or whatever, Red, however Red wants to do it. Mags were a huge complaint, but again, I never had one fail on me. Not the one terabyte or when they switched from one terabyte to nine, whatever the, that number was, or the 512s. And I had several of those and they never, ever failed on me. Um, let's see, I was saying earlier, if Komodo stayed the same, it's enough for me for a long time. And that's And that's true here too. If Komodo stayed the same, nothing changes in my production business. If Canon, Sony, Nikon, Blackmagic, Airy, if they all release brand new cameras, nothing changes in my production business today. It doesn't matter because these are the cameras that are making my work possible. See, I don't buy it to BS. I need the newest camera every time it's released. And, and you realize that, you know, in some ways, those people that are doing the upgrades are showing support for that creator. But I'm going to tell you, like I have, a, I have friends that work primarily in stills work, right? So they do photography mainly. Some of them do architectural photography. Others do like fashion stuff. Um, some do jewelry. And <laughs> I want to make sure that I, I'm very careful with my words because I don't want to give away who this person is or who these people are. But when they upgraded from, say, the Canon flagship to the latest and greatest canon stills body they hated it until they learned right the differences until they learned that all the presets that they had set up in capture one and so on needed to be tweaked and now they're fine but that initial transition causes disruption because one thing that canon does a lot is that with each firmware or each sensor or each image processing that is done on a different camera, the colors get tweaked. So you can't really apply, say, your same presets or LUTs from a C70 to an R5C or an R5 or a C500 Mark II. It doesn't work that way. What I love about RED is that I can pick up a Komodo, a DSMC2, DSMC1, a Raptor, it doesn't matter. Take all that footage in, and my workflow is identical. I don't have to rethink things. That's what I like about it. <laughs> and by the way, if you guys have not checked out Driven Films um, YouTube channel, you should. Really cool information. And I just like the way he delivers content. It's just really cool. Uh, let's see. My wish list for future Komodo, Super 35, Global Shutter, 8K, 40, 8K? You're going all the way to 8K? Whoa. That would be sick. That's that's good. CF Express Type B, yep. External monitor option, whoa. Uh, configurable for 3G or 12G SDI. I like the way you're thinking, Scott. That would actually be pretty cool. 
yeah, I don't know that I, I'd ever want to get rid of Global Shutter anymore. And I'll say this, and I never would have understood it until I did it, right? So, like, if I saw somebody else's handheld work, I would have never understood what I'm about to say. But motion looks so good on a global shutter. Handheld work looks so good on a global shutter. And maybe it's because I've never shot on a global shutter before. But I just really enjoy it. Um, I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, N87. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, the Pavo 75 millimeter looks good. Okay. Scott. Thank you for confirming this, Scott. Uh, let's see here. If this camera was 4K 120, it would be a dream. I'm going to tell you that 4K is nice, but 6K is better. Right? Like 6K is the sweet spot for almost everything that I do. If I need to reframe, everything that we're delivering at this point is either 1080 or 4K. So needing to reframe, reframe when shooting in 6K allows me not to lose resolution, and I really enjoy it. So 4K 120, I feel like that's the, the uh, Canon and Sony mirrorless party trick. Uh, I'm going to post this here because I think it needs attention. So, yeah. I'm not going to participate in that conversation. Uh... <laughs> I agree, Driven Films, we don't need to talk about this stuff. It's stupid. Man, the conversation I had with Mehdi Hapoy and his colorist. Scott, can you put a link to that? I didn't, I didn't catch it. So I must, I don't know where I was. Um, I've been traveling. I think I said this in my last um, YouTube Live. I hit like eight states in two and a half weeks. And I'm leaving again tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah. Why they choose an Alexa LF is hilarious. So, no, wait, are you serious? Are they really only doing YouTube videos? Because that's the implication I'm getting from this string at this point. <laughs> Vertical video only went on for yeah, cool. Good. I'm glad that was a joke. Uh, t -t -t -t. Let's see. It's funny. Most clients are still wanting 1080p final product. I shoot 6K for me, and I want to shoot 8K for me. So I love shooting in 8K. And like I said, I, I was an early adopter, right? So when 8K was a thing, that's when our infrastructure was built um, to support it. And, and you're right, I love 8K. I love being able to punch in that much if I need to. There, There is something about a different look from 6K to 8K that makes 8K better. But for, well, for broadcast, which is my high-end client, right? So my national broadcast work that we do, 6K is still overkill. I deliver 4K to the... Um, TV stations and a lot of the local markets will download a 1080 and then they will use their image processing pipeline and upscale for 4K streaming or, or some crazy thing. And I'm like, why didn't you just start with the 4K file that I gave you? Whatever. But it happens. Uh, let's see. BTS Nightlife. I'm using the Portkeys monitor for Komodo. Any tips on this combo? I think somebody else must have or talked about this. I don't use port keys, so I use small HD. Um, let's see. Our work is 50% technical, 50% creative. So besides the technical specs, the camera should also inspire you to create. The Komodo really does that for me. Komodo does that for anyone who has taken the time to actually shoot with it. 
Because once you do and you see that image and you're like, I did that, you get that aha moment. And it doesn't happen with a lot of cameras because a lot of cameras don't have what I call soul. And I refer to that on Komodo specifically as depth. It's like this natural depth that happens in your shot when you didn't expect it. Uh, let's see. Agreed. Being able to push things so much in post creative process, that's incredible. It totally is. Hey, Jared. So we're all talking here about what we would change about Komodo. And it's if I can summarize it, and I'm going to summarize everybody's comments along with mine. If I could have a camera built for me specifically, I'd be cool with trading the RF mount for an EF or PL mount if I could have built-in NDs on a new version of Komodo. If I could also have faster media, so upgrade the media to CF Express Type B, that would be my number two. And then the last thing that doesn't really matter as much, but would be sort of like icing on the cake for me, would be if Komodo can shoot 60p using the entire sensor. Beyond that, there were a couple comments about an EVF or a monitor that didn't need um, like a, a cable, so SDI cable. Scott had a couple of interesting suggestions about being able to choose between 3G SDI or 12G SDI. That's kind of cool. More than one SDI port would be cool on a camera that small. Um, I usually loop it out when I need to from my monitor anyway. But beyond that, we're having a hard time figuring out why or what we would change because if nothing changes, we're still kicking ass with Komodo. And that's what this conversation has been about. Oh, so this is an interesting comment. Huh. Well. Um, if Jared wanted to jump on this live stream and fill us in on what that means... That would, I, you just kind of made me stop thinking. I'm not even processing right now. What are you saying? Are you really going to upgrade Komodo? I'm sure he's just teasing me. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate the shout out. Cool. Oh, damn. Yeah, that's kind of what I was... You, you all know that Jared likes to leak things and then tease people. I don't know him. He doesn't know me, right? And this would not be the channel where any of that would ever happen. So let's just get that straight. <laughs> uh, talk about destroying your creativity. Hmm. Yeah, let's see. Teasers you can give us. Any teasers? Good idea. Let me clear. Carlos is doing a pretty good job. <laughs> really? I mean, this is like pie in the sky, dreamland, wish list thing. That would be hilarious. <laughs> Maddie selects the LF is for other uses, not YouTube. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that, Scott, because I started thinking that he really did buy an Alexa LF to make YouTube videos, and I thought that was totally stupid. Uh, let's see. To be honest, as much as I love Komodo, the smaller V-Raptor is where it's at for me. If we didn't have such a poor Q4 2022. So um, I think for me, V-Raptor is also the, um, the natural progression of upgrade. Thanks, Carlos, for listening. And sorry for the monitor, monitor situation with the entire DSMC3 lineup. We really dropped the ball on that part. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't mind the small HD monitors. And, and really, I mean, they get the job done. So, let's see, do it, Jared. 
<laughs> um, K Komodo X incoming. Komodo X incoming. I don't think Komodo would, Red would not call their camera Komodo X. Come on. Of course, this could be the channel where he leaks stuff. Why wouldn't it? Because, I mean, because my channel's puny. What do you mean, why? Um, I feel like reticent about big YouTubers. And I don't consider myself a YouTuber. <laughs> so maybe that's a good thing. Uh, let's see. Ken and Sony goes after the mega YouTubers. I I'm not even going to go that route because it's all about for some of those brands it's all about creating hype um where it's not even merited so whatever i'm finally after many years looking forward to getting into red remember i had tears in my eyes when i saw Roy royal galactic media's video ivan at nab and thought that's the look eduardo i mean i don't know i don't know how else to explain this, but I remember the very first time that I shot on red, what that image looked like, how it made me feel, and remember thinking, did I get a little better? And I've never had another camera ever do that for me, ever. So I will always be a fan and have been. Uh, channel size doesn't matter relating to the community matters. That's true. Good point, Scott. Carlos, not sure how to jump on, dude, but I watch every one of your videos. I'm a big fan. Well, let me just send you a link. I think I can send you a link. Copy link. Uh, oh, I got to do it from YouTube, I think. This, this is the thing about lives. Let's see. Uh, all right. So this link is for Jared. So I believe that clicking on that link will allow me to just bring you in and you can take over my channel. I'm cool with that. I'm not that cool. <laughs> clicking now. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> it would be funny if like all of a sudden this thing started ringing and it's a bunch of people. That would be hilarious. <clears throat> this has become the most interesting YouTube video of the year. Well, you haven't watched Scott's channel, obviously. <clears throat> 12 channels joining now. <laughs> and Joe. Eduardo's joining. All right, you can jump on, Eduardo. What's up, man? Yeah, definitely. How you doing, man? I can't uh, hear you. Why can't I hear you? Oh, can you hear me now? Can, can you well, hear you me You know now? what? It's going to make me put on headset. Uh, Pretty good. I could, Let me grab that? my, yeah. my earpods. Oh, okay. All right. How you doing? Okay, now I can hear you without this echoing thing whatever that was happening yeah. can you hear me now yeah is that better oh fantastic well pleasure okay to finally so to eduardo you. i hate to uh, say this to you man but um jerry wants to jump on so i'm gonna have to let you go dude go go, go. okay see ya so Jared might actually be jumping on. 
Oh, because it's going to try to force the uh, the iPhone camera if you're going to be on your iPhone, I think. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. And sorry about that weird audio thing that just happened. I'll put on my headphones again if I have to. Whatever day the EVF gets released by red is the day I'm buying it. 100%. Nope, that's the real Jared. Yep, that is the real Jared in this chat, which is pretty damn awesome. Same here. I think a lot of people really would enjoy the EVF. And you know, like, I remember there was a time where I thought to myself, with all these monitors that are like daylight viewable, blah, 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 blah. Why would I ever use an EVF again? And then I found myself in the situation where I needed the damn EVF. <laughs> we were shooting some, I think it was like a, um, what was it? It, it? it had to do with horses. So we're like out in a horse I'm not a horse person. So wherever they corral horses, so there's just like dirt, right? And then it was like in the middle of the day. And it didn't matter where I aimed my camera or how I tried to position my camera. I kept getting the glare from the sand. You know, I think it's sand, whatever that dirt is that horses ride around in. Basically washing out my entire screen and I had it at full blast and I'm like, if I only had an EVF. So, yeah, EVF is something that I would absolutely um, buy as soon as I could. I think EVF feels more intimate with the shot. I filmed a narrative piece on the Kinfinity Mavo Edge kit they sent me to test, and the EVF was so nice. Cool. Uh, let's see here. Careful, Jared. Carlos gets Star Trek. <laughs> I got booted from the green room once because Phil Holland showed up. Well, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that there are very few people that I admire a lot. And my friends are some of them. And Loud and Clear is one of my friends. And he loves to rib me. And I'm okay with it. But I did, in fact, get him out of the green room because Phil Holland was coming on. So that did happen. So he's not lying. He's not exaggerating. It did happen. But our friendship is still hopefully good. Jared's joining. Sweet. Jared, you there? Well, he was there. I think I can hear him. Can you hear me? I can test, hear test, you. Test. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Hey, can you see me? I, I think you I can, can see you, me, but you can't see me. I can't oh, see you. Can? you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're on the live I stream. I can see myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. This is crazy. Yeah. So we just, or yeah. I decided I was going to have this weird, live stream today because last week I talked about like what Canon do to fix some of their cameras and I thought well what could they do to fix Komodo and the truth is I mean very little because like I and I said this to um to a lot of or, or to everyone who was watching but one of the things that happened to my company when we started shooting at Komodo is that our workflow got fast enough to where we we're at like 200% above revenue where we were before. So to find a way to improve on that is difficult for a small company like mine. Because we just, we really enjoy it. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. But what did you mean by, I must have a crystal ball, if you can share anything? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I had no idea you were doing this, of course. Uh, I don't think anybody did, but um, it was interesting because I, like I said, I watch all your videos. I'm subscribed to you and saw this, oh, Komodo X, what's going on here? And then I, I clicked on it. it was the live stream and you started saying some of the requests and um and i thought they were like a leak spec and i was like oh shit what does carlos know here that <laughs> you know nobody else knows uh <laughs> um because obviously you know komodo has been very successful uh as you mentioned not just for the intended intended use that we created it for you nailed it you know we made komodo for um really for the best crash cam possible because it was a big hole in our lineup we weren't thinking of it to be an a camera um you know we probably would have done a lot of things differently and a lot of the complaints that people have are because of you know the intentions that we had when we designed and created it and it's the missing people to take it from a you know, uh, C, D, E, F cam, crash cam to an A cam. The complaints are when people have or when they want it to be an A cam. But you guys, you know, got to give it to the community and a lot of the third party uh, manufacturers. They kind of picked it up and it's a very capable A cam, you know, and um the size of it, you know, and I've said this a million times, the size of it is, is unlike anything, you know, it's, it's this small little cube, you know, modeled after the Mamaya, but you know, it's like, it's nothing really special, but there's something special about that small little cube um, that makes it really great. It just, you know, as Scott will, will mention the audio isn't, made to be an a camera <laughs> um audio camera and but i mean it's it's a great camera the global shutter when our engineers cracked that you know to get the dynamic range with the global shutter finally uh that was kind of um a light bulb moment that made this the perfect crash cam because you need global shutter for when you're doing explosions and fast movement and everything that it was intended for. But like you said, you just said it, it's hard to go back to a rolling shutter after you have um, experienced the benefits of a global shutter, even for handheld work when you're not moving that fast. So you can imagine without, you know, with your, using your crystal ball, Komodo isn't going to be Komodo forever. There's going to be another one, um, you know, and that's, you know, common sense. Uh, but I, I love, first, I love that you're doing this. I'm a big fan and I love hearing the comments because assuming there's a new one, I think a lot of people will, will be happy. Um, because I think it bridges that gap a little bit, it pushes, if there was to be a new Komodo, it would bridge the gap between, um, you know, the crash cam and something more suitable for uh, those using it as an A cam. I just didn't say too much. <laughs> My old well, you just say if. Um, and you're right. Yeah, I mean, technology yeah. keeps Theori moving. Theoretically. Right? Yeah, right. right. Th theoretically. I mean, at, so at some point, there has to be a new one. I will say this, and, and I've said it several times on social media, but like to me, Komodo, when I started using it as an ACAM, it was Red's first multi-format camera because of that focal reducer that Canon put up. It just, yeah, it makes it it made it a, a bigger badass than my AK Helium was at the moment. And, yep. and that's why we yep, switched. Yep, yep. Yeah. 
So and the it's interesting the S thirty five sensor size because um, you know we 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 always have we've kind of flopped from S thirty five to full frame and then back to S thirty five and then full frame um, and everybody you know there's obviously the big sensor is great but you know we just released the Raptor S thirty five and um, you know, people just expect us never to make an S35 camera again. And they seem to be always surprised, but it's, it's really, uh, it's really the first choice for a lot of people. Um, you know, S35 definitely has its place. Um, and not just for fitting into glass, you know? Well, I know that for a lot of the work, I mean, a very small scale company like mine, when we're, going out with a three-man crew to do a whole commercial job that's going to take four or five days, Super 35 is a better choice. It gives us the ability to make sure that we nail our focus easier. We can punch in if we need to, like, you know, get that extra reach on the glass that we're choosing. So for a lot of reasons, Super 35 really fits well for a, a company my size and the types of productions that we go after. And, um, and when everybody's yeah, no, used I, to like cell phone video. It makes a big difference. I saw your last, uh, your, I think it was your last video too, um, the multicam and it really does. It takes it to that kind of next level. Um, and you know, you're the perfect example of using this camera to that, you know, its fullest potential. And it just makes us want to push it further. Yeah, very cool. So I'm excited. I mean, whenever, if it's tomorrow or if it's three years from now, whenever Komodo changes, I mean, I feel like this fits really well into the space, my company size space. Um, v Raptor would be more than what we need. Um, not that that I wouldn't want a view raptor. Like, like I think that that would be the natural thing. If if Komodo never get doesn't get upgraded for another, I don't know, eighteen months. Yeah, we will end up with a view raptor. If Komodo gets upgraded, we might upgrade our Komodos. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. And there's definitely theoretically, there's definitely a spot for something in between. You know, something cool. in between what Komodo is right now and what Raptor is right now. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's not just for, you know, people that know RED, but for a lot of people that Komodo is their first RED camera and they just kind of got introduced into RED and it's kind of the next level up from, you know, a lot of mirrorless cameras or whatever cameras they were using before um that jump from komodo up to raptor is pretty big it's still i mean raptor is an insanely competitively priced best deal in the world when you can go out and shoot you know something so um insignificant but important all the way up to you know a 300 million dollar blockbuster for, for the price point raptor is is incredible and then on the other side, Komodo, which is still expensive for a lot of people. It's an expensive camera, but there's not really a great step like we used to have with the Scarlet, um, you know, when it went Raven Scarlet and then mm -hmm. Epic. Uh, but we're kind of missing that kind of middle ground. So that's kind of where we're, we're looking to bring, um, you know, a path to somebody that's looking to go up from Komodo for all the reasons that you said, you know, your whole wish list of stuff. Um, you know, there's definitely a middle ground there. So I know that if I don't ask this question, and I got to apologize. Oh, sorry. I got to apologize, it, but I'm in the, I'm in a little shed in, in Big Sur uh, on, you know, really crappy internet right now. So I'm probably cutting out like a, <laughs> Crazy person. You haven't cut out yet. You haven't cut out yet, which is good. But oh, I have to ask okay, you this good. before you do cut out in case um, you feel like answering. But 
So there are multiple people on this live stream right now that I've had a conversation that feel like I do where we think Komodo was um, underpriced for what it can deliver. With that, I'm not complaining that you chose to go that route. And I know where um, the Rhino sits and where Raptor sits. So I'm guessing since you said it's somewhere in between, if there was an in between, the price would be somewhere in between 20 Rand and 6K? Maybe? Yeah, that would be a pretty, that would be a pretty good guess. We couldn't make, um, you know, Komodo, the most important price point for Komodo was it to be cheaper than a crash housing, <laughs> which was a weird, <laughs> weird thing. Um, but it had, had to be, and it's a horrible thing to say because it's such an incredible camera, but disposable in a way of when it crashed from a drone or, or crashed into a wall or crashed into a car, um, it didn't, you know, of course it's going to be expensive and hopefully you have insurance, but it didn't stop you from going for that shot. You know, $6,000 versus $50,000 is a big difference. Um, so the Komodo, we couldn't make a Komodo after all the, insanity that happened right after Komodo was released with supply chain. We couldn't make a, the Komodo again if we started over again for the same price as a Komodo is right now. And it's been pretty hard to keep it at that price. Um, so yeah, uh, when people say it was underpriced, they're probably right, especially because people are using Komodo more than we ever thought they would for bigger things than we thought they ever would, especially when you roll into that a cam thing. But I just, you know, it just feels like charging more just because it feels underpriced. Isn't really a good um, way to do things. Um, you know, as all, all the mini mag guys, <laughs> on here, <laughs> like the, like, like the bitch and moan, but the, uh, you know, hey, and I've said it a, a lot of times, Jared. My mini mags have never failed ever. They never failed. Never had to worry about yeah. it, not once. Yeah, and that's the whole argument with that whole thing. You know, there's a uh, accessories are. Um, you can't just look at the price of an accessory. There's a lot of stuff that goes into making a cost that go into making stuff, and that kind of gets spread over everything. But at the mini mag time, um, it's a very different world than it is right now. You know, with CFast and CF Express, uh, you know, now it's fast enough to do. That's why everybody is using them because they're the media now is fast enough for almost everything. I mean, we with Raptor, we're pushing it to the edge. So not all cards work, but at least a lot of cards do work. Um, and CFast on Komodo, you know, CFast was, was a pretty short lived, uh, media. It seems like it's kind of, you know, going away, but, um, you know, at the Komodo time, CFast was a blessing because it gave us that little small form factor just fast enough to, to get what we needed to do. And it was before CF Express really uh came onto the market in a big way yeah i so mean that, and I know that, was, that was that was one of your i think that was one of your kind of requests is uh faster media and that's a pretty good guess theoretically yeah and and i'll and i'll say this about the faster media like it isn't so much about just what the camera is doing but the making the the proxies or offloading you know at the end of the day or whatever like it just it saves time and that that would be the only reason. Yeah. Can I complain with paying yeah. you know under five hundred dollars for one terabyte card from Angelbird? No. That like the yeah. the price point for Komodo is perfect for that type of media. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's you know, and it's important to get make sure people are using um, Thunderbolt three readers, even you even the cards now the really fast. CF Express are faster than the um, USB 3 Gen mm -hmm. 2.2. Uh, so you can actually get, for the offloading, you can get 
uh, take advantage of that. I see a lot of people still using, you know, USB 3.1 readers to offload and wondering why it takes so long. <laughs> but, it, but you're right. It's that whole chain. It's the whole chain of not just shooting, but getting off, especially as you know, when you have a bunch of cameras, uh, you know, it just kind of compounds that you have to have that, that speed kind of going. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I'm excited. Um, I'm glad that you came on and you're willing to telling us that you are working on something. And at some point we will see something different. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a big fan, man. Love you. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. I, I saw a comment that, that we don't care about YouTubers and I swear for, you know, I swear I love you guys and you I, and I don't look at you or Scott really as YouTubers and it shouldn't be an, an offense. Um, but, uh, I just love, you know, the community and what you guys do and the knowledge that you guys share with everybody. And I don't care if it's a, I don't even know this is how many subscribers there are, but, um, if there's a hundred viewers or a thousand viewers or a million viewers, what you guys are doing, especially you, you get, you and you have gotten really personal that I think it has helped a lot of people, you know, over the last couple of months, like you went deep, deep, deep. And I think that's important for people to see on social media in general. So thank you. I'm saying yeah, thank well, you no, to you. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I feel like, uh, like my buddy here online was saying, I, I feel a little starstruck that you thought enough to make time to do this. So I appreciate it. And it is exciting to know that, you know, you understand us as creators, you understand us as a market, and you are willing on putting in the effort to get us closer to something that's going to make our life a little easier. Because at this point, they're incremental, right? It's not, if I had built in a decent camera, that just means I don't have to pack them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really easy because I, you know, and I'm, it's kind of weird to say, but I really am one of you, you know, I, I'm excited to go out and shoot stuff. And I just get lucky because I get to build the cameras that I want to shoot with. But we're all the same, you know, it really comes down to, you know, finding the tool and finding, finding what you like and what you don't like. And it's always been that with me and, and shooting with your friends and talking to with your friends about, um, you know, what you're doing and, and what you want and what you don't want and what you dislike. So uh, it really is, these kind of things are really important to me and I pay attention to them, uh, because you guys drive us just like from day one with red user and the community you know we don't do focus groups or uh, if there is even such a thing in this industry but you guys are really the focus groups we talk to the filmmakers and that's really what's important to us well that is that is but really I'll, awesome. I'll let you get back but i'll let you get back to i sorry for hijacking your no 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 I, you can hijack uh, my stream whenever you want <laughs> <laughs> but it's great i wanted you to keep going though and and keep keep saying what you like and don't like and what you want because i'm here listening yeah yeah and like i said for me like even if you were going to build me a perfect camera it's it's very minimal and i know that you know some people have mentioned you know audio this or audio that i don't care at this point when we're going out with three people to do a whole commercial shoot we're shooting on 32-bit recorders because yeah. I can't afford the audio guy because I don't have that extra seat. And um, so I don't care yeah. about audio. And also, and, and I've said this before too, um, when you shoot with the body pack recorders and you're using time code, which all the red cameras support time code, you don't have to worry about how many channels you have or don't have available. It's unlimited. And that's a big headache that we moved away from, fortunately, about six years ago. So it doesn't matter if we need 10 people to be mic'd or two people to be mic'd. We don't have that issue anymore. Yeah, it's gotten a lot easier. You know, audio is one of those things too. And, you know, just from myself, I've never hired a sound guy for my own 
personal shoots. So you just kind of need it to work. Um, and it's amazing the amount of audio equipment that's come over just over, I mean, since COVID really, that has made everything so much easier, even all the wireless labs now. Um, and you know, the time code actually works and the, you know, the recorders, it's just amazing. It's amazing to be a filmmaker today. It really is. It's, yep. it's unbelievably less of a pain in the ass than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, way, way, way. The cost of entry is also so low. It's like yeah. the only yeah. real limit is the person's creativity and willingness to learn. And that's what it should be. I mean, that's what it really should be. It should be about the talent of the filmmaker, not the tool. And, you know, people say that all the time, you know, I, do I need the net new camera? Do I need the new camera? Do I need to buy, I've got a monster. Do I need to buy a Raptor? And I usually tell them to go back and watch social network, which is, you know, shot on a red one. And if you release sh social network tomorrow or next month in the theaters and looked at how incredible that film is, it's really got nothing to do about the camera. It's the talent of the filmmakers and that's the that's the reality i mean you can shoot on a komodo now you know a six thousand dollar camera there's no reason you can't go out and shoot uh something so incredible looking and play it on a big screen on a big theater and have anybody complain and that to me is absolutely incredible because it just narrows it right back to what you said is it's about the talent of the of the filmmaker, which it should be, you know? Yeah, no, Kom Komodo Punch is way above its class. Um, it did from day one. And, um, and you know, you probably have heard me say this, but w the very first time I shot on Komodo and I'm looking at it, I'm like, did, did my skills get better or, or what just happened? Because that camera has soul, like it legitimately has soul. And I've talked to Phil Holland about that before, and he's like, yeah, you're right. I mean, it does. There is something extra yeah. that's in that camera that is it's just not matched in the market. And and I really enjoy it. Monstro still a beast. And um yeah. And, and everything about Monstro is. is beautiful. It it is. And you know, Komodo had to be it had to match the bigger cameras. That was the whole point of it. You know, that was the number one um, for the filmmakers was, you know, the, their co biggest complaint was we can only use 11 frames of a GoPro before it takes you out of the, out of the picture because it's just so different. And, you know, the mirrorless cameras with the rolling shutter, you just can't really use them um, for the, for the hardcore action stuff. So, that's Komodo hat to match. You'd have to be able to put in a Komodo footage from a Komodo and match, you know, the Raptor or the Monstro or any of the other cameras. Um, and so that was. So Jared just froze. We probably, I think he used the Skylink in case any of you guys are wondering what's happening here. <laughs> I think Skylink is oh, my job. Yeah, glitching. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I, I'm pretty far away from. I'm literally in the. As you can see, I'm in my back shed here, so I'm far away from anything. Talking on my cell phone. Well, again, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for for jumping on here, and um, and I'm excited to see what comes next with, from Red. All right. All right, brother, get back to it. And thank you so much. And I'll just go back to being a viewer. <laughs> okay. thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Bye. Well, that was unexpected. Way, 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 way unexpected. And pretty awesome. So what do we know? We know that Red listens to the user base. We know that Jared 
has heard effectively what we all said we want and said they understand that there is a gap between the Rhino and the Komodo and they are working on something, which I think is kind of cool. He also said that he thought that some of the stuff that I said I wanted, you know, like the faster media, potentially the EF mount with Andes, sounded like potentially a spec leak. I don't know that, you know, he might have been teasing me, probably was teasing me. If any of it comes to fruition, if any of it becomes a real thing, I think Komodo's just kicked all the other camera companies in the nuts. <laughs> That's my opinion from someone who uses multiple Komodos on a regular basis. I hope you guys enjoy this live stream. I don't even know like, like where to go from here, right? I mean, I started with my whole pie in the sky wish list thing and Jared jumps on and basically says, hey, we, we've heard the comments about the monitor. We heard the comments about the EVF. We heard the comments about, you know, these other things. And that, that's something that they care about and want to work towards at some point bringing to market. And just to recap, the whole price thing, somewhere between Komodo and Rhino. Scott seems to think it's going to be $9,999. How awesome would that be if that was the price point? Pretty damn awesome. So, yeah, the comments are going kind of nuts right now, and I can't keep up with them, and there's no way I'm going to read them all because we've been doing this for two hours. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of crazy. And um, I got a pack because I'm flying out tomorrow. So I'm going to say this. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone, for contributing with what it is that you guys would like to see in a new version of a Komodo camera or whatever comes next from Canon or from Canon, from Red. What am I saying? Um, I had a lot of fun. We need to do this again next week. And I really appreciate you all joining in. So until next time, take care and I'll catch up with you guys on the next live stream. See you guys.